Welcome to Verify This, the show that answers your questions and separates fact from fiction so you can determine whether viral claims online are true or false. I'm your host, Brandon Lewis. Here's a quick look at what we're covering today on Verify This. Will the UK change its money to mark the reign of King Charles III? Is Illinois no longer requiring bail for people accused of violent crimes? Was the new Omicron-specific vaccine tested only on mice? What is an ad for Medicare coverage really selling? And do nearly all teachers spend money out of their own pockets on school supplies for their classrooms? The answers to these questions and more are coming up on Verify This. But first, this show is all about answering your questions. So as we move through these stories, if something comes to mind that you want verified, just text us at 202-410-8808. Once you sign up for our daily Fast Facts, you can send us those questions. We could feature your question and the answer in next week's show. This week, people around the world mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth II. She was the world's second longest reigning monarch ever, and her portrait was on every coin and many pounds in the UK, leaving many people on social media wondering what happens to the currency now that there's a new king. So we got you the answer. Queen Elizabeth II is featured on all coins in the UK and some paper money. Her death prompted several social media users to wonder if they'll have to get used to a new face on their currency. So let's verify. Will King Charles III's likeness start appearing on money in the UK? Our sources are the Royal Family, the Bank of England, and the Royal Mint. The image of the reigning monarch has graced English money since the first century. Each time a new reign began, the nation's money would update. The Royal Mint and UK banks that produce currency say coins and notes that have the Queen's image will remain legal tender as new money with the King is produced. When it comes out, King Charles is expected to be looking left instead of right, as Queen Elizabeth did. This continues a tradition that began in the 1600s, where the new monarch would face the opposite direction of the predecessor. So yes, King Charles III's likeness will start appearing on money in the UK. However, he is not expected to appear on regular paper money produced in Scotland and Northern Ireland. These countries issue their own banknotes, which do not feature the monarch. It's time for this week's first Did You Know, where we feature one relatively unknown, interesting fact that we, of course, verified. Did you know Queen Elizabeth II appeared on more currencies than any other monarch in history? During her reign, she appeared on money in at least 33 countries, commonwealths, and territories. Her first appearance was in 1935, when Canada put the then eight-year-old future queen on its $20 note. This week, we also featured more answers to questions about the monarchy in our daily newsletter. It has a new Did You Know Every Day, as well as three fast facts and more of our most recent stories. To sign up, go to verifythis.com slash email. A viral post on social media claims that starting in 2023, people arrested for some violent offenses in Illinois are no longer required to post bail before being released, pending their trial. Casey Decker looks into the details of the state's new bail reform law called the Safety Act. Last year, the governor of Illinois signed a law called the Safety Act that aimed to reform the state's criminal justice system. Some of its key provisions take effect at the start of 2023, and in just the past week or so, we've gotten a ton of questions from Verify viewers about the impending changes. Katerina asked us via text, did Illinois really pass a law that will eliminate bail? So let's verify. Our sources are the full text of the Safety Act, the governor's office, and the Illinois State Bar Association. One of the key clauses of this law reads, quote, on and after January 1st, 2023, the requirement of posting monetary bail is abolished in Illinois. So what does that mean? Well, first off, this doesn't affect convicted criminals at all. Bail isn't a punishment for committing a crime. It's designed as an incentive for people charged with a crime to show up to their court dates. But criminal justice reform advocates have long argued it's an unfair system because whether you wait for trial in a jail cell or at home is decided by how much money you have, meaning poor people who don't pose much of a threat could stay locked up while more dangerous rich people are let free. Eliminating bail only affects that pre-trial process. That brings us to the second important point. The law also doesn't mean people charged with crimes will automatically be released. Defendants can still be held in jail. There just won't be any dollar figures attached to that detention. 
Instead, judges will only consider the severity of the charges, the flight risk, and the danger the defendant could pose to specific people or the community if they aren't held. A lawyer with the Illinois State Bar Association's Committee on Racial Inequity told us, quote, judges retain discretion to deny pretrial release to people when necessary to protect someone else's safety. So we can verify, yes, Illinois is eliminating cash bail starting next year, but that doesn't mean it's releasing all detained people from jail or any convicted people from prison. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. If you see misinformation spreading, then do like those Verify viewers did and let us know about it. The easiest way is to tag us in it at Verify This using your favorite social media platform. Then we'll get right to work looking into those claims. Americans 12 and older are now eligible for an updated COVID-19 booster that's specifically formulated for the Omicron variant. Some social media users claim the vaccine was only tested on mice, not humans, before it was released. So we looked into the research to find out if that's true. On August 31st, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration authorized an updated booster shot for COVID-19 that also protects against most prominent subvariants of Omicron. People on social media criticized the decision because they said vaccine makers only tested the boosters on mice. Verify viewer Brian emailed us to ask if the new boosters weren't tested on humans. So Brian, let's verify. Were the updated Omicron booster shots tested on mice, not humans, before they were authorized? Our sources are the FDA, vaccine makers Pfizer and Moderna, and Jennifer Pancorbo with North Carolina State University's Biomanufacturing Training and Education Center. When a vaccine is first developed, it undergoes rigorous testing and human clinical trials before it's authorized for use, as we saw with the original COVID-19 vaccine. This is because vaccine makers are creating something new and they need to prove the delivery system or method of how your body learns to protect itself is safe and effective. When a vaccine requires updating, manufacturers use the same delivery service. They just tweak what it's teaching the body. Everything else in that construct that we're using to vaccinate people is exactly the same over and over and over and over. These updates don't require lengthy human trials because vaccine makers do test them on animals to make sure they're effective. We see this every year when a new flu vaccine is released. It's only tested on animals because it's similar to previous versions. In the case of the new COVID-19 boosters, manufacturers were conducting human trials on an Omicron booster before the BA4 and 5 subvariants appeared. The FDA directed vaccine makers to also add protection against those strains too, since they're now the most prevalent variants. The vaccine makers then tested the updated boosters on mice to confirm it works. So yes, the updated Omicron booster shots were tested on mice, not humans, before they were authorized. But this is very common among all vaccines when they're being updated and not created from scratch. We answered more of your questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. Just go to verifythis.com and search for COVID-19 to find our stories. Medicare open enrollment begins on October 15th, and it's a good opportunity to make sure that you have a plan that meets your needs. You may even see some ads that promise to put more money in your pocket. So we looked into what these ads are really selling. Medicare open enrollment is coming up, and Verify viewer JB saw this ad about benefits he might be missing out on. You may be entitled to the Medicare benefit that adds money to your Social Security check every single month. JB says he's new to Social Security and wants to know if he can really get more money in his monthly check. So let's verify. Are Medicare ads that claim to put money back in your Social Security check true? Our sources are the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Social Security Administration, and the Kaiser Family Foundation. We want to tell you up front that this claim needs context. This ad and others like it are trying to sell you a Medicare Advantage plan. That would mean you opt out of your original Medicare coverage and replace it with a plan offered by a private company. These plans are a lot like other insurance plans that you get through an employer or state healthcare exchange. The Kaiser Family Foundation says some cost more but offer more comprehensive coverage while others cost less monthly but might require more out-of-pocket expenses later. This ad that JB emailed us about highlights Medicare Advantage plans that offer a premium reduction benefit. Here's how this connects to Social Security. Let's start with your check. Every month, an amount is deducted to pay for Medicare, and that's it for people on original Medicare. But if you choose a Medicare Advantage plan, it's a bit more complicated. 
money comes out of your check for the standard Medicare amount. Medicare sends that money to the insurance company you have your plan with. But if you have a premium reduction benefit, then the insurance company sends some of that money back to your Social Security check. The exact amount varies based on the plan. The downside is that you may end up with a plan that has a smaller network of doctors or may charge more for procedures than original Medicare. So while you may get more money in your Social Security check, it could cost you more in the long run, which is why this ad needs context. So just like when selecting a health insurance plan through your employer, it's important to consider your expected needs and financial situation when choosing whether to switch to a Medicare Advantage plan. Medicare offers a comparison tool on its website to help you decide whether switching plans makes the most sense. That story came about because JB sent us a link to the ad and wanted to know if it's true. You can be just like JB or do one even better and record yourself asking the question and then emailing the video to us at questions at verifythis.com and you could end up in next week's show. A new school year is underway, but before the first students entered the classroom, teachers worked hard to get ready. A Department of Education study found that 94% of teachers pay for school supplies out of their own pockets. Adigan Day Till looks into whether that's really the case. Pencils, check. Notebooks, check. Scissors you have and glue. Back to school season can get pretty pricey. The National Retail Federation says that families with children in elementary school through high school plan to spend on average $864 this year on school supplies. That number is up $167 from 2019. But there are many school supplies above the basics that aren't covered by parents or provided by the school. The burden of purchasing those items often falls on teachers, according to several posts on social media. Many people claim that 94% of teachers have had to dip into their own pockets to buy school supplies. But is that true? Let's verify. Our sources are the Department of Education, Washington State's K-12 Education Department, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools in North Carolina, Houston Independent School District in Texas, as well as Donors Choose and AdoptAClassroom.org, two crowdsourcing classroom funding sites. We don't keep twisting, twisting, twisting. Nope, they're already ready to go. In her pre-kindergarten classroom at Friendship Blow Pierce Elementary School in Washington, D.C., where Dominique Foster spends her day teaching four-year-olds, the 2022 D.C. Teacher of the Year recipient sat down with Verify to talk about her experience paying for classroom supplies. I used to somewhat be embarrassed uh, by how much money I would spend for my classroom. Yeah, you can make numbers, letters. A classroom decked out with stations for sensory play, science and discovery, creativity and imagination, and even cooking. Foster says throughout her 20 years of teaching, she spent tens of thousands of dollars of her own money, making sure her students have the supplies they need to succeed. A lot of money that she prefers to call an investment. I've never known a teacher who didn't spend money. It absolutely is the norm, and sometimes it is the expectation. Two of the country's largest school districts and one state education department told Verify that they fund basic school supplies within the limitations of their budget, which are often dictated by enrollment. A spokesperson from Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, the public school system for the Mecklenburg County in North Carolina, told Verify, quote, the district gives teachers the necessary equipment and supplies for their classroom. However, some teachers supplement supplies to enhance their lessons. They acquire these through personal purchases and donations. According to Houston Independent School District, the largest public school district in Texas, if teachers want or need other supplies that the school's budget doesn't support, they often use options like Amazon's wish list. Just stay over there for a few minutes so we can have some fun, we can talk. Foster says teachers feel enormous pressure to teach at high levels while being underpaid and under-resourced. And that pressure usually pushes teachers to go out and find it or buy it themselves. A study from 2015 conducted by the Department of Education found that 94% of public school teachers use their own money on school supplies. The agency says this is their most recent data on this topic, but according to more recent studies, that number may actually be higher. A 2018 survey conducted of 4,400 teachers by adoptaclassroom.org found that 96% of teachers purchase basic school supplies for their classrooms and for their students whose families are unable to afford them. And a survey of teachers registered on the Donors Choose website showed that on average, those teachers spend $750 per year on those supplies. So we can verify, 94% of teachers do report paying for school supplies out of pocket. In fact, the number 
maybe even higher. The chairs and pillows, the stand, the fountain. In addition uh, to the, the money Foster has spent uh, out of pocket, of the... she's also received thousands in donations from both DonorsChoose and AdoptAClassroom.org, investments that she hopes will leave a lasting impression on her students. With your Verify, I'm Ariane Till. We're working on stories about the many factors that are impacting the teacher shortage in schools nationwide. We want to hear from teachers who recently left the profession and those who are considering moving on. If you or someone you know could help us with this story, send an email to questions at verifythis.com with your name, where you teach or taught, and why you left or are considering leaving the classroom. Thanks in advance. We have time for one last did you know before we go. And naturally, we opted for another queen-related fact to share, given the global interest in the monarchy. Queen Elizabeth II visited the U.S. five times during her reign. The first visit was in 1957. And did you know while visiting the D.C. area, she attended her first and only college football game? The queen wanted to see a typical American sport, so she was invited to watch the University of Maryland Terrapins football team play the University of North Carolina Tar Heels. It was quite a spectacle as fans packed the stadium to celebrate her appearance. The queen was presented with an autographed football and a special halftime show, but she couldn't stay for the whole game. She left a few minutes early to attend a dinner with President Eisenhower and avoid the crush of fans. Good to see even royalty wants to beat the traffic home. On behalf of our entire Verify team, I hope you enjoyed our show and learned something new today. I'm your host, Brandon Lewis. Don't forget, there are many more stories on our website, verifythis.com. And please, click the watch button to see even more of our stories. As always, if there's something else you want us to verify, just sign up for our free daily fast facts by texting VERIFY to 202-410-8808. Once you're signed up, you can text us your claims or questions using the same number. If you send your question to us as a video, you could end up in the show. Our number is still on the screen, so lock us in and we'll see you back here next week with answers to more of your questions, Verified. For more episodes of Verify This, go to our video on demand, click on shows at the top of your screen. There, you'll find past episodes of Verify This, plus other shows on demand.